It's not just the six flags of visitors screaming these days. Investors are making some noise after the company ran into serious cash flow trouble. It's a big brand, everybody knows it, and there's some big names involved here as well. How about Daniel Snyder, owner of the Washington Redskins? How about Bill Gates? These guys put in a lot of money into Six Flags a few years ago, and now they have lost it all. Now, Six Flags Parks filing for bankruptcy over the weekend, that company reporting its debts of over $2 billion, despite the fact that Six Flags had more than 25 million visitors last year. So what in the world's happening? So what in the world's happening? So what in the world's happening? For the last two decades, Magic Mountain got to reap the windfall of massive Six Flags investments. From 1990 to 2009, the park introduced 13 coasters. You could start to see the wheels falling off the train, heading into the mid-2000s. And despite a drastic effort to save the chain starting in 2005, the economic crash of 2008 was the death blow. Six Flags filed for bankruptcy in June of 2009 and emerged from bankruptcy nearly a year later. The company started off with $2.7 billion of debt and came out of the ordeal with just $1 billion of debt, achieved by turning the ownership of the company over to bondholders, with multiple hedge funds owning its bonds, and investing more than $700 million into the Six Flags Entertainment Corporation. All of the existing shares of stock were wiped out, and Six Flags applied to list newly issued shares on the New York Stock Exchange. Dan Snyder was a key player in trying to save the chain before its demise, but he was not part of the reorganized board of directors. With the economy in shambles, Six Flags appealed to investors by saying that people would opt to have more fun close to home, and that meant trips to their local Six Flags parks. But 2009 was still a bad year for the chain, with attendance down 6% and revenue down 11%. The new decade started off with park president Jay Thomas leaving Magic Mountain for a job in the corporate office in Dallas, replaced by Bonnie Reb John from Warner Brothers. But before that, she had worked at Magic Mountain for 22 years, starting off as an entry-level worker in 1985. She also became the first woman to claim the title as president of Magic Mountain. Rabjohn was taking over a park with a questionable future. For so long, it had benefited from the biggest and best coasters in the market. But those $20 million rides, coming on a near yearly basis, was what got the chain in trouble in the first place. Right out of the chute, we would get a glimpse of the future of Six Flags. In fact, the park was supposed to open a new coaster for the 2010 season. Well, not exactly new. Six Flags lost Six Flags New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and within a couple of years, they started taking rides out to use at their other parks. Magic Mountain was the lucky winner of the Vacoma Junior Coaster, Roadrunners Express, set to open in the back corner of the park near Deja Vu, and with the name Mr. Six's Dance Coaster. But construction delays forced the park to push the opening back to 2011. It seems like there was a lot of uncertainty around this coaster, as by late summer, the park confirmed that the Mr. Six theme would not be used. Rather, it would be called Little Flash to go along with the DC theme. And then in the fall, they confirmed the ride would not be set next to Deja Vu. It would be in Bugs Bunny World, and it would use the site occupied by Yosemite's Sam Sierra Falls, marking the end of the raft slide's 17-year run. The location in Bugs Bunny World would also lead the park to go with a Looney Tunes theme, opting for the same Roadrunner Express name it used at Six Flags New Orleans. Roadrunner was late to the party, and it wouldn't be making its debut alone in 2011. Superman The Escape closed down without notice in July of 2010, with a sign indicating that it wouldn't reopen until 2011, with Australia's Tower of Terror getting a makeover that same year that included turning the cars around to face backwards. This seemed to be the direction that Magic Mountain was headed also. In October, the park confirmed the future of Superman. It would now be known as Superman Escape from Krypton. The gray tower would be painted blue, red, and yellow, and the trains would run backwards. The lap bars would be replaced with over-the-shoulder restraints. The first additions for the park following bankruptcy were a relocated family coaster and a renovation of an existing coaster. But there was something else in Magic Mountain's bag of tricks for 2011, and it was something they probably wish had never been unleashed onto the public. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern First Flight.
on the small plot of land between Batman the Ride and Tidal Wave, on the former spot of their Enterprise, Reactor, a very compact Intamin wing coaster would emerge. This would be called Green Lantern First Flight, its opening coinciding with the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern film hitting theaters that summer. This was the Intamin Zaxpin model, with three other installations in Europe, but this was the first one to come to America. Its spring opening date would be delayed through May, into June, and finally would open on July 1st. Standing 105 feet tall and covering 810 feet of track, riders would spin freely on a vertical axis, going both forward and backwards. But as mechanics quickly found out, the ride had a weird quirk, where the train would come back to the station upside down. Extra weight was added to the trains, and the spinning was reduced to help solve the problem. But it made the ride's forces uncomfortable, and the ride's popularity started to suffer. Green Lantern was the main attraction in the brand new DC Universe, a total renovation of the old Gotham City area with bright and vibrant colors that contrasted the drab and grimy feel of Gotham City. Grinder's Gearworks was rethemed to Wonder Woman, and Atom Smasher was rethemed to The Flash. Green Lantern marked the park's 18th coaster, overtaking Cedar Point for the most coasters in any park in the world, but that wouldn't last long. Early in the year, rumors started circulating about the possibility of Deja Vu being removed and sent to Six Flags New England. In October, that rumor was confirmed to be true. It didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense for the park to give up their coaster record voluntarily. But this wasn't the Six Flags of old. This was post-bankruptcy Six Flags. They were looking to move pieces around the chain to maximize their value. This included taking Iron Wolf out of Great America and giving it to Six Flags America, Raging Cajun making the same trek a couple years later, and Pandemonium moving from Discovery Kingdom to Mexico. Deja Vu at Magic Mountain was only 10 years old, but it was the only one of the original three that still remained in the chain. Its maintenance and capacity issues became a problem, and it seems like Six Flags wanted to get it to a park with less foot traffic, and also to get it to a park that could use it more than Magic Mountain. The chain as a whole started shedding its license deals by 2011, sticking to Looney Tunes and DC Comics properties, but otherwise going with more generic themes. This affected Magic Mountain, when Terminator Salvation the Ride turned into Apocalypse, and Thomas Town turned into Whistle Stop Park. 2011 may have been the park's 40th anniversary celebration, but it was also the year that we had to say goodbye to two of the park's originals. One was the Metro, the monorail that had been standing idle for 10 years up to that point, but it was finally to be removed from the park. There are still pieces of the Metro standing to this day, generally out of the view of the public, but are easily visible if you know where to look. The other ride to bid farewell was the beloved Log Jammer. On October 31st, 2011, the last log would make its final splashdown. Without any official warning from the park, Logjammer's closure was a surprise to a lot of parkgoers. The Metro and Logjammer's simultaneous removals were no coincidence. The park was prepping their land for something big in 2013. But in the meantime, the park was not about to leave its guests empty-handed for the 2012 season. In September 2011, the park unveiled the world's tallest drop tower, Lex Luthor Drop of Doom. Built by Intamin, it would make use of its very own 415-foot Superman tower to hoist riders up either side dropping them 400 feet and hitting speeds of 85 miles per hour, with the ride coming to a gradual stop with magnetic brakes. The park ended a very busy 2011 with 2.7 million guests, a 3.8% increase from 2010. Magic Mountain continued their exodus of older or problematic rides into 2012, as they removed Thrill Shot in February. The SNS Slingshot hadn't operated since 2009 because of maintenance issues, but they were eager to reveal their next big project. And in March, the park revealed a one-of-a-kind roller coaster. Let's go! Oh, yeah. Full Throttle would feature the world's tallest loop at 160 feet, two launches, a top speed of 70 miles per hour, and would be the only coaster in the world traversing a loop underneath and on top, as the ride's finale was a near vertical drop off the top of that record breaking loop. It would be located on the site of Logjammer, draining all the water from the area and a complete overhaul of the front of the park. The restaurant in the front, once the chicken plantation, then Justice League Feast, then Johnny Rockets, then What the Fried, was removed in favor of Full Throttle's entrance, as well as a new stage for live music. The old arcade would be overhauled and turned into a shop and two restaurants. Full Throttle would start right next to the Logjammer station, but would hop on top of the mountain, over Superman's Plaza, and go into a dive drop, into the tunnel, that was once used as one of Metro's stations. A reverse LSM launch would take riders back up the dive drop, before boosting the train to its top speed of 70 miles per hour, and then diving off the loop and into the brakes. As for the theme, it was all about living life to the fullest. As Tim Burkhart said, everyone thinks they live their life full throttle. It doesn't matter if you're eight years old and riding a skateboard, 
or 80 years old and watching someone ride a skateboard. The newly renovated Superman Escape from Krypton fell victim to the park's newest rides, having to be closed for the construction of Lex Luthor, which even required a helicopter to install pieces at the highest point, and then closed again when crews needed to work on Full Throttle's section of track over the plaza. But from the park's standpoint, it was worth it, as Full Throttle ushered in a modern look for the front of the park, instantly becoming the park's most popular ride when it opened on June 22, 2013. This would also be the year that Six Flags would unveil their dining pass, where guests could pay one price for the year and get two meals on each visit, with lunch in the first half of the day and dinner in the second half. Six Flags would also have to deal with a horrifying incident on July 19th, as a woman was ejected and killed on the new Texas giant at Six Flags Over Texas. The issue was a restraint that was not properly locked, pointing out the need for an additional restraint mechanism, seatbelts. Magic Mountain would add seatbelts to Full Throttle and Goliath later in the year. 2013 also saw the demise of the world's largest man-made tree, the giant sequoia that served as the entrance of Bugs Bunny World. This had been installed with the High Sierra Territory back in 1993. This was part of yet another renovation of the kids' area of the park, set to open in 2014, featuring a brand new kids' coaster. This would be Speedy Gonzales Hot Rod Racers, a Zamperla Gravity Coaster, replacing Foghorn Leghorn's Barnyard Railway, as well as Tweety's Escape, which would be moved next to Roadrunner Express. The removal of the tree also saw the removal of Mooseburger Lodge, the main full-service restaurant in the park. This was converted into the Full Throttle Sports Bar, fitting the theme of the adjacent Full Throttle Plaza, and part of the recent trend to bring alcohol back to certain areas of the park. Even though concerts were discontinued at the park for years, American Idol winner Scotty McCreary performed at the July 4th Fest, sponsored by Coca-Cola, where on the July 4th weekend, you could get into the park an hour early with a can of Coke, and enjoy early ride time on a few coasters, as well as games, a party at the Full Throttle Plaza, and fireworks. This was when the park introduced biometric scanners, verifying your pass not based on your picture, but based on your fingerprint. This would be a more secure, albeit slow, method to admit people into the park. At Magic Mountain and across the chain, Six Flags started running their Batman the Ride inverted coasters backward for a limited time. This was a no-cost gimmick to give its guests something new to come experience. 2014 had its problems also. Right after the July 4th Fest, Green Lantern closed after a death on one of its sister coasters in Spain. A teenager was killed when its harness flew open. This was at Terra Mitica on a ride called Inferno. An inspection was done on the restraints to make sure that this could never happen on Green Lantern. On the same day of this incident, a tree fell on Ninja's track and caused the front car to derail, stalling the ride. Firefighters had to come onto the scene and rescue 22 riders after being stuck for about two hours. Two people in the front car needed to go to the hospital, but nobody else reported injuries. The ride would be inspected by Cal OSHA and reopened 12 days later, with a lot of the trees surrounding the ride being cut down to avoid a repeat incident. This was also around the time the Sky Tower gave its last rides also, forced to be closed by the state due to a regulatory issue. In order to reopen it, the ride would need a multi-million dollar upgrade to the elevator to bring it up to code as an amusement ride, and the park did not want to apportion the money for that project. But there was one more major announcement in 2014. One that was an emotional gut punch for the park's longtime fans. Still a thrill ride, thrill seekers are flocking to Six Flags Magic Mountain for a chance to ride the Colossus roller coaster one last time. Word is out, this is it for Colossus. On June 3rd, 2014, Magic Mountain announced that Colossus would be closing in mid-August. Banners went up around the park, telling people to take advantage of their last chance to ride the king of wooden roller coasters. Park spokeswoman Sue Carpenter said the park would announce exciting future plans that the guests should love. This clue fed into speculation that Colossus would not actually be removed. It would just be overhauled. By 2014, there was a way forming through the amusement industry, unlike anything it had ever seen. Old or rough wooden coasters were getting new life, thanks to a new invention from Rocky Mountain Construction, the iBox track. It started right after Six Flags came out of bankruptcy, when the chain was looking for inexpensive ways to build thrill rides giving RMC their first project at Six Flags Over Texas and their Texas Giant Coaster, redoing the whole layout to include steep drops, sharp airtime hills, and overbank turns over a glossy smooth track. It was a huge success, and Six Flags employed RMC to overhaul the Rattler at Fiesta, Texas, this one featuring an inversion. In 2014, RMC did the same thing to Medusa at Six Flags Mexico. Coaster enthusiasts could see the writing on the wall, but the park remained silent about the future of Colossus. Two weeks before its closure, the park held a 36-hour marathon for 24 riders, one hour for every year the ride had served the park. Riders who could make it for the entire 36 hours would win gold season passes good at all Six Flags parks. 
the weekend Colossus gave its final ride. The park announced that its plans for the coaster would be released on August 28th. The park would not disappoint. Twisted Colossus would keep the iconic white wooden structure of the original, as well as the dual tracks, but it would now be a Mobius Loop coaster, using just one station, but having the train traverse both sides. One blue track, one green track, making it the longest hybrid coaster in the world, with nearly 5,000 feet of track. RMC would sync up the elements, so the trains would have several different interaction points. Work got started on the conversion right away, and the project got some national attention when a welder set fire to the peak of the lift hill on September 9th causing an impressive blaze that lasted 38 minutes, collapsing a large chunk of the coaster at the top, but causing no other damage to the structure. The park voiced their confidence that its May 2015 opening date was still on track. In fact, the construction manager said the fire was a good thing. As he described it, we had a decontamination issue that went up in smoke. Magic Mountain would wrap up 2014 with the first ever Holiday in the Park event, decking the park with more than 1 million lights, falling snow, light shows, carolers, crafts, holiday treats, and a chance for kids to meet Santa and Mrs. Claus. This would become an extremely popular event for the park throughout the years, on the level of Fright Fest. The park was gearing up for a strong 2015 with their new world-class hybrid coaster, and would give the entire area the facelift it needed. The Colossus County Fair section is an offshoot of the main path of the park, and with the old Colossus and Scream being the main attractions, it didn't get a lot of foot traffic. This was now known as the Scream Punk District, with a steampunk theme. The Magic Moments Theater would now be the Gearworks Theater, Ben and Jerry's would now be Twisted Witches, and Scream would get a brand new paint job, with solid blue track and orange supports. Twisted Colossus would open right on schedule, on Memorial Day weekend, drawing in massive crowds and receiving a huge ovation from just about everyone, many of whom were getting their first taste of a hybrid coaster. Where 2015 was all about the thrills, and introducing the Scream Punk District as a new area of the park, Magic Mountain focused on another section of the park for 2016, the Entry Plaza. The restaurants and retail shops were repainting, Cyber Cafe was reverted back to the Plaza Cafe, as smartphones made the allure of logging online obsolete, though the park would start offering free Wi-Fi throughout the park. The Orient Express, an original ride from 1971, which would take riders to the top of the hill, would now be known as the Helpful Honda Express, and was given a fresh paint job. This wasn't the first time the park would name a ride after a sponsor, as Jetstream was renamed Arrowhead Splashdown between 2001 and 2006. So why focus on the Entry Plaza in 2016? because the headline edition of the year was the New Revolution, the first coaster that guests see when they enter the park. This was the complete refurbishment of Revolution, celebrating its 40th anniversary in 2016, replacing its old trains with over-the-shoulder restraints and lap bars, with fresh, modern-looking trains with just a lap bar. The coaster would also get a fresh coat of white and blue paint, lights tracing the loop, and virtual reality headsets. This was one of many coasters across the Six Flags chain to offer the virtual reality experience where riders would be immersed into a world that was synced up with the movements of the ride. The main show was a battle with space aliens, and for the winter, the show would change to a ride on Santa's sleigh. The whole operation was a showcase for the Samsung VR headsets, and yet another cheap method for post-bankruptcy Six Flags to offer its guests a new experience. As Dennis Spiegel of International Theme Park Services said, they can change it annually. Just rewrite the software, rather than spend $25 million on a new coaster. Virtual reality turned out to be a fad more than a mainstay for the chain, as the VR experience moved from Revolution to Lex Luthor Drop of Doom by 2018, and time will tell if they'll bring it back in another capacity in the future. 2016 was a huge year for the park, bringing in 3.3 million guests and boosting their 2015 numbers by 7.3%, the same year Universal's attendance ballooned by nearly 14%, thanks to the opening of the Wizarding World. Magic Mountain continued their push for renovation in 2017, this time focusing on the movie district. This is where you'd find the Batman Theater, Riddler's Revenge, and JB Smokehouse. The Batman Theater would be demolished in early 2016, making room for a brand new ride, the interactive shooting dark ride called Justice League Battle for Metropolis. This was popular at other Six Flags parks at the time, but Magic Mountain had never seen a ride quite like it. These rides that doubled as games were growing in popularity, with every Southern California park offering at least one, before Magic Mountain debuted Justice League in the summer of 2017. This was part of a brand new area called Metropolis, removing the rock wall in the middle, turning JB's into a similar barbecue restaurant called Ace of Clubs, and giving Riddler's Revenge a brand new paint job, turning its black supports yellow. Just outside of Metropolis, Green Lantern First Flight would close down unexpectedly at the end of summer. Low ridership and complaints had prompted the park to make some adjustments to help the ride experience, 
and trim brakes were installed to control the speed through the turns. Despite this, the ride remained dormant and its future was in question. Around the same time Green Lantern shut down, the park announced that it would operate 365 days a year starting in 2018. The move was aimed to make the park a major destination resort, like Disneyland and Universal, hoping to draw in international tourists and seeing a year-round schedule as the way to do it. The park didn't have an on-site hotel to host these guests, but officials in the park hinted that that may be in their future. With attendance up 17% from 2014 to 2016, the demand for the park seemed to justify the expanded schedule. Though the park would launch a campaign early in 2018, advertising how empty the park is on weekdays in the winter, and how many rides you can just walk onto. 2018 kicked off with the departure of park president Barney Rebjohn, now known as Bonnie Sherman Weber, taking a job at the corporate office in Texas, and the park welcoming back its old director of operations as the new president, Neil Thurman. Coming off a two-year stint as the president of Six Flags Great Adventure, Thurman brought the park into 2018 with yet another renovation underway, this being the midway area between DC Universe and Metropolis. All of the game booths that dominate the area were given a fresh paint job, and another park original was given a full renovation. The Sandblasters were given new cars, a new light package, and was renamed Jam and Bumpers. Scrambler was repainted and given a shade cover, but the main attraction causing this overhaul would be Crisanity, a Zamperla Giga Discovery Pendulum Ride, swinging riders up to 172 feet in the air. It opened in July as the tallest of its kind in the world. Before Crisanity even opened, land was being cleared in Cyclone Bay, and walls started appearing with signs teasing yet another ride. Two is better than one in 2019. One, two, three, four. Ready, set, go into 2019. Victory is in our future, new in 2019. Racing towards bigger thrills in 2019. New thrills coming to the West Coast in 2019. Not even two months after Crisanity opened to the public, Neil Thurman held a special event on August 29th, 2018, announcing the park's newest coaster, West Coast Racers. This premier ride's launch coaster would mimic Twisted Colossus in its dual interactive moments, and being a Mobius loop, where riders could experience both the white and the yellow tracks. This would be part of a renovation of another part of the park, their seventh year in a row doing so, and this one needed it the most. Cyclone Bay, named after a ride that was removed 12 years prior, would now be called the Underground, referencing the underground street racing culture of Los Angeles. And the park partnered with West Coast Customs out of Burbank to theme the ride and the area as a whole. 48 years after opening its gates as a small regional park to draw people to the Valencia Valley, Magic Mountain was about to become the first park in the world to reach the 20 roller coaster milestone. But there was just one problem, Green Lantern. Its future was still in doubt, now closed for a full year and no opening date in sight. The work the park had done in the ride made everyone think that it would reopen at some point, but on March 23, 2019, the park confirmed that it would be removed. That same night and throughout the next day, Green Lantern was seen doing test runs, a peculiar move for a ride that was just announced for removal. But the rumor was, there was someone from another park there to see the ride in action, and perhaps it was Laurent, the Six Flags Park in Montreal, Canada. Those rumors turned out to be true, as Six Flags announced in August that Green Lantern would be reborn at La Ronde as V-Pair, and it started being taken apart a month later. The park would also do away with its biometric finger scanners, after being sued in Illinois over privacy concerns, and switch back to a system where they stored your picture, and it would appear when your pass is scanned, the same system Cedar Fair uses. Meanwhile, West Coast Racers was facing massive delays. A rainy winter didn't help, neither did the track being shipped overseas from Italy. Pieces started arriving in February, Vertical construction started in May, and by mid-July, only about half the track was up. The park wouldn't start its passholder previews until December 21st, with an official opening day of January 9th. This made West Coast Racers the de facto new addition for 2020, but the park had something up their sleeve for 2021. Markers started appearing from the Green Lantern site in DC Universe all the way to Metropolis, a massive footprint for what seemed like a new ride. Permits were filed for a new roller coaster in the area, a near clone of the RMC single rail Raptor, Jersey Devil, coming to Great Adventure for 2020. This would be the park's big addition for their 50th anniversary and their official 20th coaster. But the world had different plans, and the coronavirus outbreak shut the park down from March 13, 2020, all the way until April 1, 2021. Construction crews have been dismantling Tidal Wave, and it seems like their 20th coaster is still on track, even if it's a year late. And that brings us to today. Looking back 50 years at the marvelous history of one of the best thrill parks in the world, from its humble beginnings, sporting Gold Rusher and Log Jammer as its main rides, to the addition of two world-class coasters over the decade, to joining the Six Flags chain, to its future being threatened by gang violence, to becoming the place for the biggest and best record-breaking coasters, to the danger of being sold to real estate developers, 
to becoming the first in the world to reach the elusive 20 mark, to being shut down for more than an entire year, but coming back strong. We've looked at the park's past, but now we look at the park's future. There's a massive housing development being built in the hills around the perimeter, which could be a great thing for the park, or it could cause problems. Six Flags has been employing their post-bankruptcy investment plan for 10 years now, and even though it's certainly different, it hasn't been a bad thing for Magic Mountain. The future of Magic Mountain looks bright, heading into the second half of its first century. Thank you all so much for joining me on this journey throughout the 50 years of Magic Mountain. This is the final episode of the five episode series. So if you haven't seen the rest of the videos and you're interested, those links are down below. If you have a couple hours to spare, it may be worth sitting down and binging the whole thing. Before you go, if you can drop this video a like and share it with whoever may be interested, I would really appreciate it. This has been by far the biggest project in my channel's history and I welcome any support. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all next time.